Welcome to day 30 of your dental MBA. Congratulations for making it this far. Probably the reason you made it this far is because you probably someday wanted to retire. Hopefully you want to retire a millionaire. My dad always says if it's been done before, it's probably possible. If it's never been done before, there might be a reason. There's a hundred million households in the United States living in 300,000 neighborhoods and 3.8 or almost four out of every hundred households retired a millionaire. So if four out of every hundred households can make it to a millionaire, average one getting there about 57 years old, there's no reason a dentist can't. Um, I can tell, there are, there are so many dentists who retire millionaires, I could not count them um, in a Rolodex. So listen up, let's have fun. Congratulations for making it this far. If you started on day 30, you're a jerk. Stop the tape now, go back to day one, and uh, let's rock and roll. You're never going to be a millionaire unless you know one through 29, but uh, let's rock and roll. The number one professional competence, oh, I, I, like all days, I always like to finish up a little bit the day before, a little bit of review from day 29, but the number one professional competence of group practice is cross-consultation and professional camaraderie. Why do you, is it really, do you really want to be a millionaire at 57 when you sat in a cave for 25 years, bored, alone, where your only intellectual stimulus, stimulation was a, um, you know, a, a supply man walking in once a month. Uh, I love it when I'm sitting there looking at x-rays with my uh, associates, um, going over stuff, the professional camaraderie. When you're talking about external marketing, when moving your practice, buying a practice to merge in with yours or using direct mail to attract new patients, remember, most people have mental blocks about going across rivers and interstates. They act as real psychological barriers to trade entry. If you really want to go, uh, you really think this area of town is really booming and you can't go in there and you go across the interstate and you think they're going to come across that interstate or come across the river, they're not. Satellite offices double your fixed cost. On the aggregate, satellite offices double your fixed cost, not your variable cost. Fixed costs are usually 15% of collections, while variable costs are usually 65. Fixed costs include the opportunity cost of the dentist, staff labor, lab and sundries, I mean variable costs. Satellite offices generally are very lucrative for special overhead, but have a very poor outcome for the far more competitive environment of the general dentist, family dentist that runs a total cost overhead of nearly 80% if you include the opportunity cost of the dentist. Bernie Fink is a must here, the guy's funnier in hell, he um, speaks on group practice. He just spoke at the ADA in San Fran. He says the average general practice nets 31% of collections. It shouldn't cost any more for an accountant to prepare your taxes, whether you're incorporated or not. I know when I tell a lot of dentists to get incorporated, a lot of their objection is, yeah, but I hear there's a lot more paperwork and it really drives up your accounting costs. Um, your accountant's jerking your chain. In fact, your accountant has far more experience in dealing with incorporations and can do those faster than a sole proprietor. Always incorporate your practice in a generic name so you don't have to change the name during a practice transition. Remember, the day you start your practice, you have the whole vision. The vision has got to be the whole deal. When you're 25 years you know, your practice, where do you see yourself at 65? In fact, when you're looking at your goals, you've got to, you've got to ask yourself, I mean, who's alive that was there 1800? Part of your goals, you should be a vision where you want to be at the time of death. You know, when you're taking your last breath, where do you want to be? What do you want to say on your tombstone? What did you want to accomplish? So part of your business plan has to always be your exit strategy. Everybody that's in their own business without an exit strategy is myopic. They never had a vision in the first place. Most of the billionaires, not only did they know where they envisioned their practice, their business, they envisioned where they wanted to be 100 years after. I mean, look at them. Uh, look at the Johnson Johnson Trust Fund, the Rockefeller Fund. These people knew what they wanted for their business. They knew what they wanted for their country. They knew what they wanted for earthlings. They knew what they wanted. I mean, they, they thought this thing out all the way to the end. You have to have a complete vision that includes um, where you want your uh, to be 100 years after you're dead. Merger, mergernomics, or we call mergers and acquisitions, is something that all free enterprise does all day long profitably. Dentists barely understand it. Do you realize that in 1995, America had 12,000 banks, and by the year 2000, it was down to 8,000? 4,000 banks were merged, acquired. Uh, mainly, it was uh, software problems with Y2K, and they decided instead of fixing it, to merge in with someone else. But I'm telling you, 
I have met more multi-millionaires in dentistry that built up their practice by, they opened up their practice, they bought a practice, and every time some 60-year-old dentist retired within a five-mile radius of their office, they bought the practice, merged it in theirs, and, bought, and built some monster practices. In fact, I think dollar for dollar, there's no cheaper way to buy new patients than mergers and acquisitions. Once again, AFCO, 100 consultants in the field, all 50 states, have done about $300 million of these things, and you wouldn't believe what you, um, you've seen. After 10 years, the average orthodontist obtains 60 to 80% of the referrals from their own patients. That's the same with orthodontist, periodontist, and pedodontist, okay? Endodontists and oral surgeons are all referral dentists. So remember, if you're setting up an ortho practice, perio practice, or pedo practice, um, you'll wean off those general dentist referrals um, within the first 10 years. Money owed on orthodontics is not account receivables. It's work in process. That's why Lazarus of Orthodontic Centers of America has a market cap of a billion dollars, the only one trade on the New York Stock Exchange, because your orthodontist, mom comes in to buy ortho, and remember, 80% of everything sold in America that costs more than a thousand has been financed with installment credit in the last 10 years, and orthodontists say, well, the ortho is gonna be $4,000, I need it all today, even though they didn't incur their cost today, they're gonna see this person for 10 or 15 minutes, once a month for 28 months. So why? Did, so when Lazar said, we'll do the ortho for 100 bucks a month and we'll spread it out, that's because he was making profit on each visit every step of the way. He didn't have to have money up front. And then everybody says, well, man, he's carrying his own account receivables. It's not account receivables, it's work in progress. You figure when someone comes in for ortho, what do they need, a pano and a SAF? Okay, that's a buck each, they got two bucks in there. What do they need, study models? Okay, they got another 50 cents in it, so they got 250, and you need a third down? And then the, the brackets, all the brackets were ortho. If you buy the most expensive stuff in the world, it costs you 150 bucks. You buy in quantity, you get some uh, middle of the road stuff, you can do it for 100. So if they're paying $110 a visit, first one, I mean, I mean, you don't have to finance things when you haven't incurred the cost for it. The four main management skills needed for success especially if you want to get to a millionaire, is the management of cash flow, the management of systems, the management of people, and the management of yourself. If you sit there and at five o'clock every day after you head to the bars and get drunk and you can't deal with the stuff on the weekend or whatever, you're dysfunctional. If you hate people, you're never gonna build up an organization. If you can't set up systems, you're gonna to have to do everything yourself, so you're never gonna get any bigger or any, uh, any more efficiency than whatever you can do yourself and it all comes down to cash flow. Not the P&L that shows you're making a profit when you're going bankrupt, it's cash flow. There's a great book called Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. I hope by now you've read it several times. The title is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, Not Work Hard and Grow Rich by I Am Nuts. First of all, when we're talking about being a millionaire, I want you to put it in perspective. This is the, uh, let's go into this picture here. This is the picture I have above my mantle. This was doing some charity dentistry out in uh, Chiapas, Mexico. This is the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I mean, beautiful as far as earthling and what she philosophically, poetically represents. She's 12 years old, and guess who that is on that backpack? That's her bambino. That rag there, look at that picture closely. That rag there, that baby, that's one diaper. She rinses off of the river. You can smell this girl from 20 feet. I mean, it is stench with the word S. I mean, it's unbelievable. Look at her feet. They're all barefoot. Go up close to those feet. Look at those feet. They have, you know how like when you use a shovel, you'll build a callus? They have pebbles calloused into their feet. You can literally take an elevator and pop a pebble out of her foot that'll fly clear across the room. They skedaddle over rocks and twigs and branches up and down those mountains carrying their baby wrapped in stench with those feet. I mean, it's unbelievable. You're trying to be a millionaire in the richest country in the world. Let me tell you, the number one determinant of being wealthy in the world is the time and place you're born. Americans have four percent of the world's population. They have 25 percent of all the money. In 1998, the United, the, the United States had an eight trillion dollar economy of the world's 32 trillion dollar economy. One out of every four dollars of the world's economy is right here in the United States. Let me tell you something. You still have two 
billion of the world's six billion people making less than a dollar a day. In fact, minimum wage in the United States has always been, the minimum wage for one hour work in the United States has always been higher than a day's wage in Mexico, our, our border to the south, where 98 million people live, where a day's wage has never caught up with our minimum wage for one hour work. So if you want to be a millionaire, I'll tell you right now, if you're watching this video in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, England, Germany, France, Italy, or the places we do so well in, Sweden, Switzerland, you're already a millionaire. And if you don't believe it, pull your head out of your yin yang, go to Albania, go to Bangladesh, go to Tanzania, 10 of the bottom, poor, the 10 poorest countries in the world. Uh, 224 registered at the United Nations are all in Africa, right by each other. Go to Tanz Tanzania and tell me if you're a millionaire or not. Go to Tanzania or go to the Serengeti. Um, go to Serengeti. It's a real neat deal. And uh, you'll be building their economy. And when you're not looking at zebra and you're not looking at giraffes and you're not looking at rhinoceros, look at the people and you just count your lucky stars that from an act that had nothing to do with you, you were happened to be born here instead of other places around the world. I put that girl above my mantle to keep me having perspective. Um, and then, uh, then I try to put that, go back to the screen. Here's my world. Okay, I got that on my mantle. Then there's my four boys, season tickets to the Coyotes, Disneyland. My boys go to, they love to go to Las Vegas. How they go to Las Vegas three, four times a year, stay at the Mirage. They love that little Treasure Island thing. They love to go down there. And uh, the oldest two always um, get me to take them down there. They like to go bungee jumping. Um, I've been bungee jumping with my nine-year-old and uh, seven-year-old uh, several times. They said they wanted to go do it, and I thought they were, uh, didn't know what the hell they were talking about, so I told them yes, and when I got there, uh, it took them about an hour to convince me to do it, and I was scared to death. My knees vibrating, almost threw up, and they wanted to do it again. I had to do it. Not only did I have to do it, I had to do it twice in a row, but how do you go back from that little girl's world? I mean, are you saying three more years, my little Eric could be ready to be a father? I mean, that's a joke. Here's the hut they live in. All dirt floors, go back to the screen there. Look at, look at that. All dirt floors, no running water. Um, they have a little creek there. It's about four feet wide. And uh, first time we ever went down there, uh, Jerome Smith, the guy that heads this all up, and, and you should I really get involved with his Mexico ministry, send him money, go down there with him. He's got dental clinics in Antioch. He's got them in Chiapas. He's got a couple of them going to Mexico. And um, the creek there, they do all their washing there. They do all their cooking water, but you, but you have to get involved with these people. Um, you know, it's no fun to go poop and not have any toilet paper. So what do those people in the poor do? They like to poop in the water because then it cleans them off. And so they poop in their own water. They drink out of their own water. They bathe their own clothes in water. He brought back a vial of water. It had 1,500 parts per million fecal matter floating in the water. It's really a whole different world. Do some close-up of these houses here. You know, you're sitting there and you want to remodel your house or put in a tennis court or get a boat or a cabin. How would you like that to be your main residency? I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, here's uh, more of the people walking around and they go off far away looking for firewood. Those girls are barefoot. And although that outfit looks bright, that is the outfit, okay? You can smell these girls coming up the road when you're upwind or down, uh, yeah, upwind. And uh, look at those faces when you get down there and uh, bringing them in. And uh, they um, don't have much energy. They got pernicious anemia. They're barefoot. They die of things like pneumonia, cholera, water poison. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and, and what's funny is they're still rich in culture. They're happy. They bawl their eyes out when their babies die. They still get around at night and sing. Uh, they come in to show you their broken tooth or their, uh, they got a cavity or an abscess. That's what their legs look like. That's what their arms look like. People, that's how one third of the world lives today. I mean, you got countries like China. Um, you go far enough into China, they haven't even seen uh, white people. It's, uh, it's amazing. In fact, I would say living on the world right now, you definitely have a time machine. If you were to go 500 years back into time, all you have to do is get on an airplane today and go visit the third world. And even though they're poor in physical assets and technology and cable stereo, Human nature is unbelievably resilient. These people are rich in culture. They have love. They uh, dress themselves up. Uh, life goes on, and you'll learn more about human nature. Getting, you know, my dad always said, you'll never know you're a canary in a coal mine till you get out and meet a cat in a gold mine. 
and uh, you're a cat in a gold mine, you're an American, and it's funny wherever you go around the world. You know, <laughs> it's so funny. People walk up to you and they know you're American. I mean, any country you go to, they can tell you're a rich, gosh, and you just reek, you reek of wealth. Hell, you can tell by, they can tell by your teeth you're an American. I mean, you go to England. I mean, the Queen of England has a big old distal class three amalgam on six. The, uh, e even the rich royalty that have ortho of four by custom extraction, caved in, bird beak bites. And you go to Poland, uh, the girl with seven teeth is the rich one. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, so, you know, what does they say on the Statue of Liberty? You know, that's my favorite ins inscription. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And the bastard that cut off immigration in 1918, that'd dig up that president and turn him over and slap him with a shovel. Here's the funnest way you'll do dentistry. Let Jerome Smith in Lafayette, Louis, uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. His name's Jerome Smith, DDS, Lafayette, Louisiana. We always run articles on him in the uh, Foreign Report. Um, he runs Mexico Ministry. He's so cool. You get to go down. It's the only place in the world you go do dentistry while you're smoking a big stogie. I mean, I just love it. And they, uh, they, they poor people down there, they think it smells good. And then you come back and your wife will get mad because all your clothes smells like stench, tobacco. But uh, my God, you can go down there and you can have a stogie in one hand, a big old Diet Coke on another, and just absolutely realize how rich you are. Wealth comes from an attitude of gratitude. You've got to think of growing the pie. Um, go back to these pictures here. These, these are really neat. There's a, um, us four darn dentists realized we we're there to pull all these teeth and they got all these jungle diseases. So Jerome, you know, passes the hat. I think he collected, I think it was, um, I don't know, I forgot what it was, like $25 a day to go to Mexico City and bring back the, uh, the richest, uh, uh, or no, it was, uh, I forgot where it was. There's a big city, about a million. So he goes down there and brings one of the most prominent surgeon doctors back for about 25 bucks a day. On the way back, we stopped at a pharmacy, bought the entire pharmacy for $200 in cash. So here we had the best doctor. We had the entire flipping pharmacy. And he's back there because, you know, we felt bad. We we're fixing his teeth and they got, they got you know, they got um, scabbies and they got pernicious anemia and they got uh, worms and they got all these things. And we're like, oh my God, we're dentists from America and we got our fellowship and our MAGD and we seek implants, but we forgot the lecture about scabbies and, uh, and worms and all that stuff. But you just really feel good and it's really fun. And I'll tell you what, you can feel the power of the benefits of building the wealth of a nation. I mean, Adam Smith, 1776, the wealth of nations, what every country in the world would do if their leaders could only read and understand that book once. And uh, they're just, uh, I mean, it's just, there's Carl Bro, Carl Bro uh, practicing law at Louisiana. It was just a bunch of good old boys from Louisiana. They go down to Chiapas on a couple times a year. Um, if you're, um, I don't care how long you've been practicing or whatever, you need to get out of the United States once or twice. You need to do missionary dentistry, missionary medicine. And I really think that a doctor, dentist who practices 40 years in the United States and never got turned on to the joys of missionary dentistry, is really cutting themselves short. I mean, you got dentists that are divorcing their wife because they lost money on an investment. I mean, how far away did you get from your center? When you and your wife split up over a failed investment, and furthermore, you know, when you see dentists killing themselves, and you find out from the wife, well, what did he kill himself? Well, we dumped $100,000 into a limited partnership, and the deal went bad, and he hung himself. You get down there, and it really affects your mind because you come back and then dentists are calling you up and they're all stressed off because their overhead went up 2%. And they're all stressed about this. And you're sitting there, you just got back from the jungle and you're just like, wow, these guys. I mean, you get so far out of kilter. You're already a millionaire. Here's the uh, minister who was a, um, I think he was a, I don't know what he was, a Baptist Lutheran. He ran a ministry in Dallas and the church had tennis courts and daycare and had everything. And he went down there one time and he was so spiritually overtaken, he never came back to the United States. His name's Larry's. He's the uh, head minister guy of this Mexico Ministries. And um, he finds people like this guy here. And go to close up this guy's face. We, and he finds people like that. So what does Jerome do? Jerome sneaks them back to the United States, gets surgery on them. It's unbe unbelievable. Here we are in their um, church they just built. And they're teaching these guys dentistry. Uh, how to brush your teeth or how to floss or how to read or whatever. And uh, it's just so fun. 
And then here's a, um, you know, they're pretty. And, and here's an interesting thing in the Indians. I did not know this, but Indians do not have male pattern baldness. And we're back in the jungle. These kids have never seen a bald man. And every time I would sit down, um, the kids would get closer and closer and closer. And then one kid would finally, like, reach out and fill my head and go, ooh. And then all the kids would run and they just, every time I sat down, they all wanted to feel the top of my head. It was so damn funny. And, uh, you know, take your dad in there. If you got teenage kids that are all worried about Nikes and all that kind of stuff, uh, take them in there to really give them attitude check. I'll never forget the first time I took my four boys down there into Mexico and we we're doing a little missionary stuff down here by Rocky Point. And the first thing my four year, my five year old um, asked me, he said, Daddy, how come they don't have swimming pools? <laughs> how come they don't have swimming pools? Ryan, they don't have shoes. Where the hell are they going to put the swimming pool? The four steps to retire as a millionaire are. Start saving for retirement now. The earlier you start saving, the easier it is to be reach your retirement goal. A person desiring a retirement income of 60,000 per year needs to save $3,000 annually from 30 to 65. If the same person starts saving at age 40, they would need to save 7,000 annually for the same period of goal. So the rule in retirement is you need a little bit of money for a long length of time, or you need a lot of money for a short length of time. You've got to start now. If you start funding a $2,000 per year IRA at age 25, the total amount you have to deposit at age 65 is 80,000. But with the miracle of compound interest, it will have grown to $973,000 and you'll be earning an annual interest only income of $116,000 per year. $2,000 a year is only $5.48 per day. That's your fast food lunch. Uh, if you're spending $2.74 each day for lunch for yourself, $2.74 each day for your fast food lunch for your wife. I mean, when Americans got Nike shoes on, Gucci purses, going to Disneyland, going to casinos, buying Levi 501 jeans, and they can't even fund their tax-free IRA every year starting at age 25. I mean, I'm telling you, you're an idiot. And go hear Greg Stanley. Greg Stanley wrote the book on retiring for dentists. His number is 602-934-2108. 602-934-2108. The luckiest move I ever made was right out of dental school, start up my practice, and this uh, dentist told me, he said, my gosh, if I was, you know, the only, th I said, well, you know, I'd always ask these dentists, I'd say, well, if you had to do it all over again, what would you have done? And this older dentist said to me, he said, you know, if I'd have to do the whole thing over again, I wish to hell I would have heard Greg Stanley the first day I got out of school. And I thought, okay, and I looked up a seminar, and it was like uh, 600 bucks for me and my wife, and I thought, well, that's a hell of a lot of money, and I called that guy up, I said, man, that son of a gun uh, won 600 bucks. Do you have like his handouts or his materials or whatever? He said, Howard, you don't get it, just go. So I thought, okay, went and got it. I went, my wife went, because I really believe that um, if you're really married in one homogenous unit, you shouldn't get, keep getting turned on to a bunch of information experiences without your significant other, or you can be programmed to drift apart. So I always think if I'm going to go somewhere and I might be getting a lot of data or a lot of uh, something that might change me for one way or the other, I want to do it with my spouse so we grow together. Me and my sweetie went there. We listened to Greg Stanley. We've swallowed the whole line, hook, line, and sinker. And I mean, my gosh, I um, owe Greg so much uh, as long as there's not any of the cash he made me. And uh, to retire, you either need a little money and a lot of time or a lot of money and a little time. Run to hear Greg Stanley today. Um, go and hear one of his seminars, 602-934-2108. Don't let yourself talk yourself out of it for a second. Remember, he's got data on 14,000 dentists, okay? 6% of dentists retire with a net worth of less than $50,000 at retirement. 24% have between 100 and 200,000 35% have between 200 and 500,000, 15% have 500,000 to a million, 4% have between 1 and 3 million, and 1% have greater than 3 million. And you're sitting there wondering if you've got a Saturday open and really want to pay $395 to go hear Greg Stanley. In fact, the number one thing dental schools could do is to have Greg Stanley come in and talk to all 54 dental schools freshman year but I wonder if the kids even be smart enough to get it there. But my gosh, if you're at 25 years old, 
the minute you're married or the minute you're 25, you haven't gone to this, you're nuts. The average dentist owns five cars during his or her career, eight cars during his life. The average dentist owns three homes during his or her career, four times during their life. And you've got money for five to eight cars, four homes, but you can't fund your 401k. I never have got that. The average dentist retires with 160,000 in the bank. The average dentist retires at age 55. We talked there earlier that it takes a long time for dentists to figure out what they're doing. Specialists start out five to nine years making 145,000 a year. It takes 14 years to average 180, 19 years to get 225, 24 years to get to 210. So it takes them 24 years after graduation to peak. Then they start sliding down the mountain. By 29 years out, they got a, they're down to 190,000 income a year. 34 years out, down to 180. And 40 years out, they're right back where they started. They piddled their practice down all the way to the bottom, the other side of the mountain, at 145,000. Imagine that you had only one dollar, which we put in a security that doubled by year end and was then sold. Imagine further that we used the after-tax proceeds to repeat this process in each of the next 19 years, scoring a double each time. At the end of the 20 years, the 34% capital gains tax that we would have paid on the profits from each sale would have delivered about $13,000 to the government, and we would be left with about $25,000. Not bad. But let's see what happens if we do it in tax-free. If, however, we made a single fantastic investment that itself doubled 20 times during the 20 years, $1 would have grown to a million $48,000. Were we then to cash out, we would pay 34% capital gains tax of roughly $356,000 and would be left with $692,000. The sole reason for this staggering difference in results would be the timing of tax payments. Interestingly, the government would gain from the scenario to an exactly the same 27 to 1 ratio as you would have. They would be taking in taxes 356,000 versus 13,000. So when they talk about, you know, the capital gains tax is stupid frickin' government always acts like they're gonna lose revenue. They can't even understand that they would benefit in the same 27 to one scenario as we would. Uh, admittedly, they'd have to wait for their money, but uh, you know, it's amazing. Uh, dental ownership facts, we talked about that, um, that associates the bottom 25% only make 40, the medium or 60,000, top 25% over 85,000. That's why everybody wants to own their own business. But there are associateships where you make, like in mine, between 145 and 165. So just because associates don't pay out any money or dentists don't retire with any money doesn't mean that you can't be an associate making between 145 or 165 or you can't own your own practice, be successful, fund your 401k, and retire with over $3 million. Um, Warren Buffett always talks about controlled company. You know, if you own your own practice, two main advantages. You get to allocate capital, whereas um, you're likely to have little or nothing to say about this process with the marketable holding or if you're an associate. The second advantage has to do with taxes. Um, when you own your own business, you know, grow grapes, not leaves. The definition of an entrepreneur is simply anyone who moves their limited resources of money, time, and capital from a lower return to a higher return. If you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Filling up uh, millionaire couples with children are five times more likely to send their children to medical school than other parents in, our, in America, and about four times more likely to send them to law school. So it's very obviously good. You weren't wasting time sitting in med school, dental school, or law school, but it's what you do with your money when you get out of there. When we talk to millionaires, and you gotta read the book, the Millionaire Next Door by Thomas J. Stanley, Ph.D., and William D. Donkey, Danke, Ph.D., 1996. These guys are the only people that talk about millionaires with 20 or 25 years of research. When we look at attitudinal, cultural belief systems of millionaires, the rich people that get to be millionaires at 3.8 out of every 100 households tend to say yes to the following three questions. Were your parents very frugal? Yes. Are you frugal? Yes. Is your spouse more frugal than you are? If you say yes to all those threes from an attitudinal, cultural, psychological, personality profile, you're probably going to be a millionaire. So flip that around. If you said no to any of this, you're in the danger zone. If your parents spent every damn dime they ever got, you're in trouble. If you're not frugal, you're in trouble. 
If your spouse is not frugal, you're in big, big trouble. Personal savings growth factor. If you sit there and have uh, a 12% return uh, with something like an index fund, it is amazing what will happen to the money as the years go by. In fact, a dollar invested in something like an index fund which averaged 12%, and gosh darn, 40 years, almost every dollar almost turns into 100. So uh, it's actually $93.05. Uh, but a dollar almost turns into 100 in 40 years at 12%. Always remember that. When we look at the top 10 most profitable sole proprietorship businesses, um, coal mining is number one, physicians are number two, osteopaths are number three, dentists are number four, believe it or not. Optometrists are number five, bowling centers are number six, chiropractors are number seven, drug stores are number eight, vet services are number nine, legal services are number 10. So congratulations, you're a dentist and the prof sovereign professional um, dentistry is in the top 10 most profitable sole proprietorship businesses. 90% of dental practices sell for two thirds their peak value. You want to get more of your money out for a millionaire? Talk to AFCO by the time you're uh, 45 to 50. Funding your IRA, 401k, or any other retirement plan is always your first priority. If you start funding a $2,000 a year IRA at 25, I've told you you're a millionaire. At 65, you live off $116,000 uh, a year interest only. When you're a gosh darn dentist, and a year goes by and you didn't fund an IRA, I mean, I don't care if it was first year out of school, you have, it has nothing to do with the money, it has nothing to do with the cash flow, you are not frugal. Remember, you always pay yourself first. The IRA for 2000 a year, uh, something you can do maybe a year or two out of school, then you gotta get right into your 401k and fund it. You can max it today at $10,000. If you haven't maxed your 401k at $10,000 a year, um, you got to take out the TV, you got to quit reading magazines, and quit going shopping. And I think the biggest behavioral problem is that frugal people, if you, give, if you leave them off Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they always go fishing, or maybe they go hunting, or maybe they go in the backyard and do a lot of, of work or work in their garden. Frugal people are, take their three-day vacation, they're frugal. You are not frugal. That three-day weekend is dangerous. You know, Friday you might sleep in, work out, go play golf or something. Saturday you might do some housework, but by Sunday you're going crazy and you go into the mall and you go buy all new uh, furniture, or you go buy patio equipment, or you go buy an outfit and all this kind of stuff. So if you're not frugal, please work more days because when you're working Friday and a half day on Saturday, number one, you're not spending money. Frugal people can have three-day weekends. But if you have a cultural problem where if you have 3D weekends and you and your wife get bored so you go out and buy a new furniture or something, uh, you're, you're crazy. Taxes are like protection money managers given to gangsters. The old concept of taxes that way they, that they are like the fees which the robber barons arbitrarily imposed or which some group of bandits squeeze out of a passerby under threat of military protection. The protection money which the gangsters used to impose in Chicago is very close to this original meaning of the word tax. The word today still carries some of this connotation that of arbitrarily greedy people who are demanding some money for which to return nothing, just simply because they're in a position of power and you have to grind your teeth and give in. That's from Abraham Maslow. A better way to look at taxes. Under good circumstances, taxes are a very different kind of thing and must be seen in a very different way. That is, as payment for necessary services at a bargain rate because otherwise the healthy long-term enterprise would have to replace all these services on a private basis, which would cost a great deal more. This is true for water, police, services, fire, all of which uh, should be subbed out to free enterprise. You should ignore political and economic forecasts when you're doing your retirement planning. They're an expensive distraction for many investors. 30 years ago, Warren Buffett says no one, he, he's the second richest man in the world. He's the only billionaire who did it from investing in Wall Street. And he says 30 years ago, no one, including him, the world's greatest investor, could have foreseen the huge expansion of the Vietnam War, wage and price controls by Richard M. Nixon, two oil shocks, the resignation of a president, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, a one-day drop in the Dow of 508 points, or treasury bills fluctuating between 2.8 and 17.4%. So don't worry about everyone else. Don't worry about the critics. 
Don't listen to interest rate forecasts. Don't listen to economists. Economists are simply people dumber than your accountant who didn't have the personality to be a CPA. Just focus on your own game. Be period by periodically investing in an index fund, the know-nothing investor can actually outperform most investment professionals. Paradoxically, when dumb money acknowledges its limitations, it ceases to be dumb. I think an index fund, it beats 70% of mutual funds. Hell, right now you have more mutual funds than stocks. Does that make any sense? And index funds are not buying and selling. They're not trading. There's no capital gains. There's far lower commissions. So that in and of itself, you beat 7 out of 10. The only way to be a millionaire, according to Abraham Maslow on management in 1998, says the fact is that ultimately there are many exits, exits I can't even say the word, existential conflicts in human life. There are many insol insolvable soluble problems. There are many situations in which we have to give up something in order to get something else. And this is the very essence of the human um, condition. Saving money is delayed gratification. You either spend it now and you're happy, or you save it and you spend it later. If you're going to be a millionaire, you have to buy into the concept of delayed gratification. The trouble is when most people talk about earning a living these days, they really mean earning an automobile, a fine house, a landscape garden, and so on and so on and so on. The fear of being without money motivates us to work hard. Then once we get that paycheck, greed or desire starts us thinking about all the wonderful things that money can buy. The pattern is then set. The pattern of get up, go to work, pay bills, get up, go to work, pay more bills. Our lives are then run forever by two emotions, fear of losing money and then the greed of what we do when we get the money. Offer more money and the cycles continue because we also increase our spending. This is what I call the rat race. Children spend years in an antiquated educational system, studying subjects they will never use, preparing for a world that no longer exists. I love this guy. He wrote a book. His name's Robert Kiyosaki and Sharon Lecter, a CPA. They live right up here in Paradise Valley, right next to um, that uh, Harvey McKay, who wrote um, uh, Swoop the Sharks Out Eating Alive. Go buy Rich Dad Poor Bag by Robert Kiyosaki, K-I-Y-O-S-A-K-I. K-I-Y-O-S-A-K-I. -I. Robert has an incredibly well-written, well-done book that you should be able to read on a Saturday. Which messages do you tell yourself? How do you program yourself? Every time you talk, Tony Robbins says you neurolinguistically program yourself, but more importantly, forget you. Every time you talk, you're programming your children. Do you say, is it, I can't afford it, or how can I afford it? Is it proper... Proper physical exercise increases your chances for health and proper mental exercises increases your chance for wealth? Or is it laziness decreases both health and wealth? Is it study hard so you can find a good company to work for? Or is it study hard so you can find a good company to buy? Are you saying out loud to yourself and your children, the reason I'm not rich is because I have you kids? Or is it the reason I must be rich is because I have you kids? Is it when it comes to money, play it safe? Or is it don't take risk, learn to manage risk? Is it our home is our largest investment and our greatest asset? Or is it my house a liability? And if your house is your largest investment, you're in trouble. Robert says, I've met so many people who say, oh, I'm not interested in money. If they will work at a job for eight hours a day, that is denial of truth. If they were not interested in money, then why are they working? That kind of thinking is probably more psychotic than a person who hoards money. There is a difference between being poor and being broke. Broke is temporary, poor is eternal. The only thing more powerful than money is a financial education. That's why a self-made millionaire can go bankrupt and be a millionaire again in a short period of time. We just had that recently in the United States. A billionaire lost all their gosh darn money and three years out, uh, a bankruptcy, billionaire again. Can you imagine that? A billionaire twice? Lost it all, took three years to get it back? Life is a struggle between ignorant illusions and earthly reality. Financial intelligence is the mental process via which we solve our financial problems. If you're going to build the Empire State Building, the first thing you need to do is dig a deep hole and pour a strong foundation. If you're going to build a home in the suburbs, all you need to do is pour a six-inch slab of concrete. Most people in their drive to get rich are trying to build an Empire State Building on a six-inch slab. Our public school system still believes in homes with no foundations. Dirt floors are still the rage. So kids graduate from school with virtually no financial foundation. 
One day, sleepless and deep in debt in suburbia, living the American dream, they decide that the answer to their financial problems is to find a way to get rich quick. Construction skyscraper begins, it goes up quickly, and soon, instead of the Empire State Building, we have the Leaning Tower of Suburbia. The reason the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the middle class struggle in debt is because the subject of money is taught at home, not in school. Most of us learn about money from our parents. So what can a poor parent tell their child about money? You must know the difference between an asset and a liability and only buy assets. If you want to be rich, it's all you need to know. It's rule number one. It's the only rule. Rich people acquire assets. The poor and middle class acquire assets. And they're so poor and middle class in American suburbia, they actually think they're a gosh darn asset. Once again, uh, can you go to the board here? Here we have... Here we have a profit and loss, which is, you know, your P&L, your income and your expense of upper class, rich, wealthy, middle class, profit and loss. And then underneath it, we'll have the balance sheet. Assets equal the liability that you owe on it with the equity you have into it. Okay, now what happens is a diagram in the middle class. They have their job. It comes in as income. They never know how much their paycheck grosses. They never even look at the gross numbers. In fact, a quick test of middle class and upper class is you ask any upper class wealthy person who works for another company, say, well, how much uh, is, was your paycheck? And they say, well, I grossed 1000 and my net was 500 You ask a middle class, all they know is their net. They say, oh, I don't know how much you took out. I just have a net, okay? Well, your job, you have income coming out. The first half is stolen by the scum-sucking Democratic Democrats, um, Al Gore, all those people. Uh, the only people worse than them are socialists like Italy and France. The only people worse than them are the absolute communists, um, Idi Amin, Joseph Stalin, Deng Xiaoping, okay? They steal half your money. Then, if that's not bad enough, what does the middle class do with the other half? They use it as a down payment to get further in debt. And then, I mean, the government steals half, so since they're poor and middle class, they vote for the people that steal half their money and then they take the remaining half and they use it for a down payment of debt and an interest consuming asset. I mean, interest consuming liability. So what happens is money comes in, money goes out, they take what's left over and they leverage themselves in deeper and deeper debt. I mean, it's almost, I'm sorry to laugh, but it's almost comical. I mean, they, they, they get their money, the government steals half, they vote for the people that steal half. And then they use it as a down payment to get farther in debt. I'm sorry to be laughing. It's not funny. Um, so what happens is they take their money after the government steals half. And they keep voting Democrat. And they use it for a down payment for a mortgage, a consumer loan. And if they run completely out of money, that's okay. They go get a credit card. Okay, so what happens? What happens? They say, well, I'll get a pay raise. Well, it's not the pay raise. It's your psychological thing. As their income goes up, let's say they make $10,000 a year. Okay, they have their expenses, they'll buy a Ford Escort or a Chevy. If you give them a raise to 20000 it's the same behavioral pattern. You give them a raise from 10000 to 20000 they say, oh, guess what? Instead of buying a Chevy, I can get a Pontiac. Give them a raise to 30000 they go, oh, now, honey, now we can get the Oldsmobile. Give them a raise to 40000 oh, now we can get the gosh darn Buick. Give them $50,000, and they'll say, oh, gosh, we can finally get a Cadillac. If these people won the frickin' lottery, they'd go buy a goddamn yacht, okay? They don't get it. It's the process. That's why the poor get poorer, the rich get richer. How does, what is a, um, what is the middle class struggle? No matter how much your income goes up, their tax rate goes up accordingly, they keep voting for the people who confiscate half their money, and they keep buying bigger and bigger liabilities. When they made $100,000 a year, uh, when they made $50,000 a year, they, they lived in a $100,000 home. They couldn't wait to earn $200,000 a year, so now they get a $300,000 home. In fact, you give these guys a half million dollars a year, they'll try to get into a $5 million home. They never, never get it. It's the whole cycle. Well, what are the, uh, so the problem is, more money will not solve your problems. In fact, they actually accelerate the problem. Money often makes obvious your tragic human flaws. Money often puts a spotlight on what you don't know. Okay, so how do wealthy people differ? Well, first of all, wealthy people believe in their balance sheet that their home is a liability. Okay, if they bought a home, they would say that was consumption. If they said their working class people believe that their home is an asset. 
People come to my office, they say, Howard, why do you have so much overhead? Why did you put so much money in your office? Because my office is a gosh darn asset. I make money off that. And they sit there and they'll say, well, 3,500 square foot dental office and you own it. That's high overhead. The same dumbass owns a 3,500 square foot home. I say, well, you own your home. And they go, well, isn't that an asset? I say, it absolutely is an asset if you're middle class. Middle class people think their home's an asset. But see, if you're a millionaire, you think your home is a liability. See, liabilities, uh, assets, um, give you money. Your gosh darn home doesn't. So what do the masses do? Masses get a paycheck. They give half of it to the government in taxes. They keep voting for Democrats. They give the rest as a down payment to get deeper in debt with their home mortgage, their car payment, consumer loans, the credit card. And after all that, they don't even have time to fund an IRA or a 401k. Well, what do the rich people do? The rich people believe that after you have an income, if you have any money left over after the blood-sucking Democrats steal half of it, and it's not really that bad. I mean, I'm not hard on Democrats because I just thank God I don't live in Italy or France or Russia, for that matter, where the blood-sucking communists take it all to where everybody's living in the land of peasantry. But would they have any money left over? They buy assets. Why? Because if you put a dollar in an asset, at the end of the year, you still have that dollar asset, but that dollar is now working for you. My dad never called a dollar a dollar. My dad always called a dollar bill an employee. He said, Howard, if I give you a dollar, it will work for you for the rest of your life. Why would you give it away? A dollar in the bank will make you a dime every year. What rich, poor people, middle class, you give them a dollar, they just give it to the first person there, and if they ever use leverage, like in the DuPont formula, profit margin times turnover equal times leverage, the middle class and the poor use their money to leverage them deeper in a hole. Rich people use it to leverage them out of the hole. So if you give, if I give you a dollar, and you put it in the bank, and die tomorrow, your dollar is still working for you. It's making you 10 cents a year. Every time you put $100 in the bank, it's making you $10. Every $10 bill is making a dollar for you every year, years and years after you're gone. If you don't understand after you're gone, look at trust funds. Look at the Johnson Johnson Foundation. Look at the Rolf Rockefeller Center. How many billionaires do you know are still living today from the ground through trust because they have dollars still working for them? So what do they do? They always, in fact, this is another thing that um, when they're buying a practice, they go, but Howard, I don't want to buy, I don't want to pay 400000 for an office. That's a lot of debt. Okay, well, if you bought a $400,000 dental office and paid it off in five years, what could you get for the dental office? You'd get at least your 400000 out of it. See, it's an asset. It's not an interest-bearing asset. If you were to sit there and put that $400,000 in an index fund, It'd be worth a million dollars five years later. In the last, if the five years I repeat itself, um, it's not a good asset. That's why I see so many dentists that own their own office, where the average one makes 122,000 a year, and then some high associates who I had one associate who made 165,000 dollars in one year decide they want to own their own place. I guarantee you, they'll never make that much again. But it's that Texas mentality where they want an acre of land in the middle of nowhere. They put a fence around it. They get a gun to protect it. They fly it into the Lone Star State. It's something hormonal. Usually when they buy their office, first thing they do is, okay, this is mine. Okay, okay, this is mine. Okay, okay, this is mine. Okay, this is mine. I owe my own practice. And then they, uh, so they bought an asset, a dental office. It's illiquid. It takes a year to uh, turn it. Um, but it is at least an asset, meaning that you can get your dollar back out of it. It's not a great asset because there are better assets that have a massive tailwind behind it, like Intel, like Microsoft, like Dell computers. I mean, why would you want to invest in a gosh darn illiquid dental office? But anyway, so what happens is they get income, they pay their taxes, then they buy assets that generate income. Now at the end of the year, this income is back up in the form of dividends and interest and more income, and then it goes back down. So this is what happens. And it just starts spiraling. And by gosh darn 5, 10, 15, 20 years, these people are living off interest only. Meanwhile, the poor are leveraged deep in a hole. So you either 
take income, pay taxes, and, and save your dollars, and have them work for you, and every time you put a $10 bill in the bank, it makes you a dollar a year for eternity, especially if you're incorporated, especially if that corporation, the shares of the corporation, are held by your family trust, so you can avoid a lot of probate as you're transferring this wealth on to whoever, to whatever you wanna do. So the rich will always get richer, the poor will always get poor, the middle class will always be confused, and that's why the Democratic Party will always be in existence, because there will always be more stupid poor people than there are rich people. And, um, and by the way, that doesn't mean I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative, I voted for H. Ross Perot, this time I'll vote for Steve Forbes, and you guys sit there and say, well, Perot's crazy. Okay, you say crazy is a guy who gets out of school and builds up a business and sells it for 3.6 billion. If that's crazy, I want to be crazy. And then you sit there and say, well, Mr. Forbes, he has a funny smile. Oh, so if some guy comes up and he's tall, dark, and handsome like Slick Willie and steals half your paycheck, that's good. But if Forbes come out and says, we're going to go Hong Kong style, 15% flat tax, you keep your money and spend it yourself, that's bad. You're an idiot. I-D-I-O-T, okay? In fact, if I had to do anything today, the only thing I often wonder is that should I just stay the hell with it, sell everything I own, and move to Hong Kong, not for my sake, for my damn kid's sake. So real assets are income producing. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds. Coke went public in 1919 at $40 per share. At year in 1993, that single share with dividends reinvested was worth more than $2 million. A diagram of wealthy people is just simply take your money, pay your blood-sucking taxes, whatever you need to rent an apartment or a tent or a condo, eat some food, and throw it in a gosh darn investment, hopefully an investment that's liquid in the New York Stock Exchange, be in there for the long run, and make sure it's an industry that's doing a tailwind. And that's the cash flow statement of rich people. They just take money, they have expenses, they buy assets. I know five years or 10 years sounds like a long time, but before you know it, you're, tw you're 30, 40, 50, 57 is when the average person is a gosh darn millionaire. Uh, the poor and the middle class work for money, the rich have money work for them. I don't work for money, money works for me. The richest man in Babylon simply said three things. Read the book. He said, give away your first 10%. What's that? Thinking in abundancy. Whatever you want, give it away. If you want your wife to be faithful, be faithful to her. If you want your wife to say nice things to you, say nice things to her. If you want your staff to be in a good mood, be in a good mood for them. Whatever you want in life, in your interdependent society, whatever you want, do it and it will come back to you. Give away your first 10%. Take the next 10%, pay down your debt. Take the next 10% invest it so it will work with you forever. And if you obey those three rules, give away the first 10, take the next 10% pay down debt, the next 10% invest in you, and you're going to be a millionaire in no time at all. Wealth is a person's ability to survive so many number of days forward. So if I stop working today, how long could I survive? Wealth is the measure of the cash flow from the asset column compared with the expense column. Net worth often includes these non-cash producing assets like your house. Wealth measures how much money your assets are making and therefore your financial survivability. If you stop working today and your income producing assets will pay all your food, bills, clothing, your debt free, you're a wealthy person. What does it mean to be rich versus wealthy? Let's say you have cash flow from an asset column of $1,000 a month and you have expenses of $2,000 a month. What is your wealth? How many days forward can you survive? Let's assume a 30-day month. By that definition, you have enough cash flow for half a month. You'll go two weeks. When you have achieved a $2,000 a month cash flow from your assets, then you will be wealthy. You may not be rich, but you're now wealthy. Just remember, the rich buy income producing assets, the middle class buy liabilities like cars and homes and think they're assets, and the poor only have expenses. At least they got a crack pipe though. When your monthly expenses keep up with your monthly wages, you're in the rat race. To become financially secure, a person needs to mind his or her own income-producing investment assets. Your investments revolve around your income-producing asset column as opposed to your paycheck income column. The number one rule is to know the difference between an income-producing asset where your money is working for you as opposed to liability. 
The rich only focus on invest in income producing assets while everyone else focuses on their paycheck income and then they want to raise so they can spend more. When downsizing became the end thing to do, millions of workers found out their largest so-called asset, their home, was eating them alive. Their asset called a house still cost them money every month. Their car, another asset, was still eating them alive. The golf clubs in the garage that cost $1,000 were not worth $1,000 anymore. They are called an illiquid asset. Don't let your money get too far from cash. I cringe every time I hear a dentist say to me that their net worth is a million dollars. One of the main reasons net worth is not accurate is simply because the moment you begin selling your assets, you're taxed for any gains. People's net worth is almost always worth less than they think. Whoever has the most employees reaches insanity first. I would not encourage anyone to start a company unless they really want to. Knowing what I know about running a company, I would not risk that task on anyone. There are times when people cannot find employment when starting a company is a solution for them. The odds are against success. Nine out of ten companies fail in five years. So only if you really have the desire to own your own company do I recommend it. Otherwise, keep your daytime job, control your spending, and build up an income-producing asset column that is strong, flexible, and liquid. Once a dollar goes into it, it should never come out. Think of it this way. Once a dollar goes in your asset column, it becomes your employee. The best thing about having all your employees be money is that they work 24 hours a day, never take a break, and can even work for generations to come. Keep your daytime job, be a great hard-working employee, but keep building your income-producing asset column. Rich people buy luxuries last, while the poor and middle class tend to buy luxuries first. The poor and middle class often buy luxury items such as big houses, diamonds, furs, jewelry, boats, because they want to look rich. They look rich, but in reality, they just get deeper in debt and usually on credit. The old money people, the long-term rich, built their income-producing asset column first. Then the income generated from these assets eventually will buy luxuries. The poor and middle class buy luxuries with their own sweat and blood. A true luxury is a reward from investing in an income producing asset. The fundamental principle of wealth is delayed gratification instead of instant gratification. The three determinants of your personal income are chance. Genes, family, culture, environment, time, the time and place you were born. For instance, if you were born in Bangladesh or Albania or Tanzania, um, you're not going to be wealthy. So first is chance. Second is personal choice. Three is coercive choices made for you by others. That's written from Milton and Rose Friedman from Free to Choose. That is, if I had to name what is the single most mind-boggling, mind-opening book I ever wrote, re, re, read, 1980, freshman year, Creighton University, Omaha, Nebraska, 12 below zero, all the girls there were corn-fed, there was nothing to do, and Milton Friedman comes out with his book, Free to Choose, by Milton and Rose Friedman, copyright 1980. If you have not read that book, good, because now you have time to go back, read it five times, memorize it. You want to give your, gift to, your kid a gift? Give him free to choose. Milton and Rose Friedman. I've never met an intelligent millionaire one time in my life who has not read free to choose. In fact, I've never met a millionaire who has never read that book. He has sold like 10 million copies of that book. Your aptitude is only determined by your attitude. True learning takes energy, passion, and a burning desire. Fear is a big part of that formula. For passion is fear and love combined. Are you fearfully falling forward or flippantly flying freely? Every single thought that you think and every word that you speak will factually determine your destiny. The fearfully falling forward say that they are bad in math and have to do five math problems. The flippantly flying freely say that math is a game and they can't wait to do five math puzzles. The fearfully falling forward say, I will be happy when. The flippantly flying freely say, I am happy now. There's no such way that you say, well, I'll be happy when I graduate from college, then you're not happy. Well, I'll be happy when I get a good job. Well, I'll be happy when I get that car. Well, I'll be happy when I retire. Or I'll be happy, I'll be happy, I'll be happy when you're never going to be happy. Because if you're not happy now, you got internal problems that need to be solved first. The fearfully falling forward always think, say, and believe negative thoughts about themselves. I don't care if they're beautiful and a fox. They always say that <coughs> they're ugly, they're fat, they're dumb. 
They also always tell their kids that they're fat and ugly or dumb. You hear them in the grocery store. Quit being dumb. Why do you always misbehave? When you tell a kid that he always misbehaves, he always misbehaves. Why do you always say, kid, you're going to be just as dumb as your dad? Why do you tell your kids, well, you're, I know why you're not good math, because I was bad math, and you're going to be just as stupid as I am. Quit being bad. Quit being stupid. Why do you always act dumb? <coughs> I tell my kids every gosh darn day, when they were born, the doctor said he never saw a baby in his life with a brain that big. In fact, the doctor said... That when you were born, the day you were born, that your brain was twice as big as my brain. In fact, I would give anything to have a brain that big. Your teachers say you're the smartest guy in the class. My kids are so hopped up full of crap that they're straight-A students. Most of them test out two years out of their school. You know, you just sit there and say things to them, like when they come read a book. How old are you, Ryan? Five? As big as your brain is, I bet you could read this whole book before the day's over. He goes back and reads it in four hours. Okay, why? Because you pump him up. The flippantly flying freely always think, say, and believe high self-esteem thoughts about themselves. Why do you think I call my wife flawless, worship the ground she walks on, and give her all my damn money? So I can have sex on demand. Emotions are what make us human. They make us real. The word emotion stands for energy in motion. Be truthful about your emotions and use your mind and emotions in your favor, not against you. Too much of a good thing can be wonderful, said Mae West. In our society, success breeds jealousy and envy. When my uncle suddenly became rich by accident, in effect, what happened was that he immediately lost the friendship of all of his relatives for reasons that any American would understand. His wealth did not rebound to the advantage of any one of his relatives. And I remember for myself that I was pretty sore about it, says Abraham Maslow. He, Abraham Maslow says he had a huge amount of money, and I was an impoverished graduate student, and he didn't help me in any way. I thought this was very selfish, and I was never friendly with him again. So see, wealth, I mean, that's Abraham Maslow speaking on Maslow Management, 1998. Read that book. The guy's a flipping genius. He also goes on to say, how do you spell relief? Many widows, let alone the divorcees, certainly have a kind of sigh of relief about the, after the initial shock and fear. Then they feel the delicious freedom, realize how they have been held down the decades, realize that they have been self abnegating, self-sacrificing, that they always put the interests of their husband, children, the home, pushing their own interests to the background. Abraham Maslow went and talked that many widows, about two to three years after their husband dies, actually sit there and say, gosh, this is delicious. How nice. That's exactly how it will feel tomorrow when you quit spending. Conspicuous consumption is a source of why you fight with your wife, your staff, why you're miserable. If you want to get rid of your stress, Stop spending money. After the initial shock and fear, you'll find this freedom that when you quit spending all your damn money, you're free, okay? You dig yourself in a hole by conspicuous spending. Why do you want to eat the Lone Star as a reward trying to get yourself pumped up? Because you're so stressed out. Why are you stressed out? Because you're always eating out. You're always buying new cars. You're always spending all your damn money. That's what causes your stress. So you're, the reason you spend money is from relief from stress, but the relief is because you spend all your damn money. In fact, isn't it funny that when you never have money, you always want to take vacations and go all these places and spend all this money, and then when you have a bunch of money, you find out you're so stress-free. I mean, I remember when I paid off my house. When I paid, when I had my student loans, my practice, my house paid off, it was really weird. It was like, you know, you're out of school, your student loans are paid off, your practice is paid off, your house is paid off, and you have no debt. And for the first time in your life, it had been like 10 or 15 years, you had that weird feeling you did back when you were 10 years old in the backyard on a swing set. I mean, it was amazing. It just, it was just weird. I mean, it was like this big monkey climbed off your gosh darn back. The average millionaire goes bankrupt six times. Take a chance, fail, grow, and succeed. Hall of Fame baseball players struck out seven out of every 10 times at bat. Wealth is not the same as income. If you make a good income each year and spend it all, you're not getting wealthier. You're just living high on the hog. Wealth is what you accumulate, not what you spend. Wealth is the result of hard work, perseverance, planning, and most of all, self-discipline, of getting self-control, of getting into delayed gratification instead of instant gratification. There had never been more personal wealth in America than there is today. Over $22 trillion is floating around in wealth. 
half of which is being held by Americans over 55. Nearly one and a half of her wealth is owned by three and a half percent of her households. Can you believe that? 50% of the wealth of this nation is held by three and a half out of every hundred households. More than 25 million households in the United States have annual incomes in excess of $50,000. More than 7 million have annual incomes over $100,000. Every one of those groups should be a goddamn millionaire. And only 3.5% of them will be. Because the other 96.5% live high in the hog, conspicuous, conspicuous consumption, because they're nuts. 3.5% of American households are in the 1 million and over net worth category. 80% of America's millionaires are first generation rich. A lot of people think millionaires are all daddy that's. My dad never gave me a dime. 80% of millionaires are first generation rich. The characteristics of the millionaires are very easy. They live well below their means. They allocate their time, energy, and money efficiently in ways conducive to wealth building. They believe that financial independence is more important than displaying high social status. Their parents did not provide economic outpatient care, a la Democrats welfare, cheese. Their adult children are economically self-sufficient. They are proficient in targeting market opportunities. They chose the right occupation. If he looks like a millionaire, he's not. In Texas, they say, big hat, no cattle. Watching sports is okay, but the biggest and fastest moving game in the world is making money. If you want to be rich, you must focus. The rich people put all of their eggs in a few baskets. The middle class put all their eggs in many baskets of loans and credit cards and debts and mortgages and car payments. The poor don't even know what an egg is. Greed is good, Michael Douglas said in the movie Wall Street. Rich people say it differently. They say guilt is worse than greed because it robs the body of its soul. If you give 100 people $10,000 at the start of the year, at the end of the year, 80 would have nothing left. In fact, many would have created greater debt by making it a down payment on a new car, refrigerator, TV, VCR, a holiday. 15 out of 100 would have increased that 10,000 by 5 to 10%. 5 would have increased it to 20,000 or more. Remember what Albert Einstein said. If you get up every day and do the same damn things you did yesterday and expect a different result, you're insane. Every dentist I've seen that's going gosh darn insane the problem is spending. The problem is the spouse spends. They just spend, 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 and then they get so stressed out they have to go to Aspen and ski for four days. Just quit spending your money, you'll be a millionaire. And by the way, my gosh, if you had half as fun as I did, what a fun 30 days. The cheapest way to see me is to get your local dental society to have me come down there, um, give me an invitation in your backyard. Thank you so much, and we'll see you later, and congratulations.